Hey Sci-Fi fans, so in this installment I'm going to talk about Altered Carbon. Only the first season in this video. I'm going to save second season for another video because they are two entirely separate animals. Entirely. And I'm going to just come right out and say it. Season one of this show is quite possibly one of the most amazing bits of sci-fi television I have seen in a long, long time. I mean, it's like Mandalorian's up there. There's, you know, there's others. Yeah, I can't remember off the top of my head, but this is up there. I mean, I'm, yeah, my reading at the end will reflect this. It is up there. So this show is, I think it was 10 episodes long, right? The season one. In that 10 episodes, they do so much in this 10 episodes that it is just completely mind blowing that it fit into these 10 episodes. I mean, it's just, there's so much going on plot-wise, that makes sense, that fits into the story. None of it is just, oh, forget that, we don't need that crap, you know, oh, it's a red herring side thing that goes nowhere. No, every piece of this puzzle fits together, and by the time you get to the end of episode 10, you're like, oh my god, this is freaking genius stuff, man. So, another thing, too, before I get into what the plot entails, is that there is a lot of jargon thrown around, new terms that they just start using, and they kind of explain and you're kind of left to infer what this means from the context that is used in. So in the future, this is, this show was like 300 something years in the future. I think 2384 is where this starts out at. Um, we've got at some point in our past, you know, like 250 years ago, it's been a while, we came across some alien technology that lets us download our personalities, our consciousness into a little disc called a stack. Now the stacks go into the little slot here on the back of your brain, right? You can be killed, but as long as your stack is intact, you can just pull it out and put it in a new body. Hey, that's convenient. You can basically live forever if you can afford the new body. So this is where you get a bunch of people called meths. Now the meths is short for Methuselah, which I believe mythology was some sort of immortal character, so as long as you have the money to continue to pay for new sleeves, that's what they call the new bodies that they get put into, as long as you can afford a new sleeve, and can, some of these meths are so rich they can even have their stacks backed up, so if your stack gets destroyed, you can just have your new, have your backup, you know, put in the new stack, put in there, and boom, Bob's your uncle, right? And that, you know, plot device is basically the core behind the entire series everything season one season two that you know plot device of the stacks and the sleeves is central to everything so what happens is this guy named uh, Takeshi Kovach getting resleeved he's waking up in his new body after being on a shelf for basically 250 years now he was part of this group called the envoys like I said this plot is really complicated and I could sit here for half an hour and try to explain every part that needs to fit together in this. I don't really know how to do that in a short 10 minute video without just glossing over a lot and that's what I'm going to have to do is just gloss over a lot. If you want the full experience and full details on every part of the story you have to watch the whole thing front to front to back and pay attention the entire time or you're going to miss stuff. I mean I had to back up and go wait what was that? Oh yeah that was yeah. So he gets re-sleeved after like 250 years by this guy named uh, Bancroft, who is one of these meth, rich, you know, meth guys, Methuselahs. Turns out he got murdered. He doesn't know who did it. They actually blew the stack out, which means he got restored from a backup that happened like a brief time earlier, so he doesn't remember who it was. That backup happened, you know, kind of like backing up your computer. If you back something up and change it, and then it gets deleted, whatever, oh, you have to go back to this point in time everything there didn't happen. So everything after that backup never happened for the um, for the stack that's walking around now in, in that sleep, right? He's also got you know enough money to keep his body cloned, you know, so every time he comes, spins back up, he's in a new, a new body, but it's still him. Now, like I said, you know, this is the, it's basically setting up a big detective story here. And in that vein, um, Kovach joins up with a cop, detective, uh, named Kirsten Ortega. Um, you've got Kovach was played by Joel Kinnaman, and I think uh, Ortega was Martha Higareda. I probably butchered that too. 
I apologize very much. But anyway, Ortega is the detective who is kind of assigned to him and we find out why and that is because the sleeve that Kovacs is wearing actually belonged to her boyfriend prior. So this is like, okay, that's some very dark shit right there, isn't it? I mean, he's walking around in the body of her former boyfriend and there's things going on and yeah, of course, it eventually happens. That's part of the story too, right? Let's see. Other key points of the story, you've got Poe, who is an AI hotel. He is the hotel and the hotel is him. Um, he's kind of representative of Edgar Allan Poe and he's sort of the, I don't know what you call it, he provides the home base for them to go back to at the end of every episode, I guess you could say. But he's also handy in being able to attach to their version of the internet. I cannot remember what it's called and I can't look it up. I'd have to actually go into the show and go, oh yeah, duh. But he is also able to go into this internet as a consciousness. You know, he's similar, but not the same. He can't be put into a body. He's created through this holographic you know, technology in the hotel or little emitter that Kovach carries around with him. Yeah, there's a lot going on here, guys, a lot. If you don't pay attention, you're gonna miss little details, little details that make a big difference. So Kovach to way back in his past, got separated from his sister, Raylene. Come to find out, Raylene is also still alive, who's also one of these meths now, who's created this very valuable empire, and she is mega rich and can do whatever she wants, basically, and she's been trying to do all this stuff for him. Now, you've also got the SeaTac, the military guy, who recruited Kovach back in the day and separated him and Raylene, said, oh, I'm going to take care of Raylene, yada, 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 instead sold her off to the Yakuza because of course they wind up meeting up together. Both of them go off to join this envoys group. He leaves the SeaTac. She joins him to uh, join this envoys group who's run by this woman called Kelcrest Falconer. Elise Goldberry, I think her name was. Um, of course, you've got a romance brewing there between Falconer and Kovach. Um, we keep getting a bunch of flashbacks, you know, back to these, these uh, almost, She's almost the Morpheus to Kovach's Neo in these scenes. It's really, we'll get to that. We'll get to that in a second. Um, but these envoys are like these super mentally disciplined um, Shaolin monks, basically. I mean, they're super trained in martial arts and the like, you know, yeah, that's convenient. It makes for some good fight scenes that aren't overly drawn out and stupid in slow motion. Thank you. They just happen. But the show, the show looks amazing, and it looks amazing because it borrows elements from so much else in sci-fi. It especially, especially Blade Runner. When you look at the scenes from San Diego, or San Diego, San Francisco. This is actually set in San Francisco. I mean, you've got the Golden Gate Bridge is basically a um, Skid Row type of place now, full of you know container houses and stuff like that. It's not a very nice place to be, basically but it's still San Francisco and it's on Earth. And it's totally Blade Runner-ish in that you've got, you know, these cars flying around, floating around, making the little late, I mean, there's just borrow stylistically so much from Blade Runner. The rain, the neon, the ramen stands, the signs. I mean, it's just, you just watch this and go, somebody was a big Blade Runner fan here. I mean, this is just, and it does it in such a way that it's not outright copying it. There's a, there's a fine line between, oh, they're just copying Blade Runner and they're throwing a nice homage to it, you know, that's what's going on here. Now you've also got the Matrix angle on this being that you can take anybody's stack, you can plug yourself into this VR construct and they actually call it that, you know, the Matrix had its construct, the loading construct, right, where you could load up guns and whatever and then go off into the, in, into the Matrix from there, right? Kind of a similar deal with this construct. You can plug yourself in and no, you can die over and over and over again in the construct versus in the matrix where you die once you're, you're dead, right? You can die over and over and over again and in very painful, horrible ways. And people use this to torture people in VR, you know, basically melt their, yeah, it's not pretty. It's not fun to even think about, but it's a thing. And it's like, whoa, that's dark as shit too, isn't it? And of course we find out that Raylene owns this place that's been doing this. You know, she's not... A nice person anymore basically and that winds up to be 
The detective story with Bancroft fuels the entire season. But at the end, it's this thing with Raylene that has been overarching everything that makes a difference at the end. And they do this whole... This is where it kind of sidetracks from the, the detective story. And you're like, well, okay, we'll let you have it because the rest of the show's just been so awesome, right? Where they have to then go eliminate Raylene. I'm not going to tell you how that ends. You can almost guess how that ends. My summary probably seems disjointed and wrong in places because I'm leaving so much out. Like I said, I could sit here for half an hour probably and I still wouldn't even scratch the surface. So, like I said, this show looks amazing. It borrows so much. I mean, there was another scene. This is where I'm talking about. It borrows from sci-fi classic stuff. Matt Frewer shows up in a scene as some kind of body dealer or something like that. And he's like this close, this close to reprising his role as Max Headroom. I swear to God, that was the first thing I saw him when he walked out and made this face. And I'm like, holy shit, that's Max Headroom. And if they don't, if they make him stutter, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna lose my shit. And they didn't, thankfully, because that would have been copying, right? He didn't stutter, thankfully. You know. Yeah. There's just all sorts of these things that you just go, now nah, I see what you did there. I see what you did there. You know, the Matrix stuff is a big one. The Blade Runner thing, that Max Headroom one. I know there was a couple more. I should have wrote them down. I slept last night. Sorry, guys. I'm recording this the next morning. Like I said, then, you know, you've got Kinnaman and uh, Martha. I'm not going to say your last name again, Martha. I'm sorry. I'm going to butcher it again. Who are absolutely spectacular in these roles. Kinnaman, I didn't know if I'd like him at first. I'd never really seen him in anything that I remember. I thought maybe they were just propping up a nice John Cena look-alike for this role. No, he actually does a pretty damn good job in this role, you know, switching back and forth between the the action hero fighting type to the detective type. He gets in the romantic interludes, he gets in some of these other situations, and he plays the role pretty damn good. Same with Martha. In her roles, there's... Then you've got uh, Purefoy as... Bancroft, and I swear to God, the first couple episodes, I thought it was Christopher Lambert. It's like him and Thomas Jane, and if they like Rant Lambert and Thomas Jane, you smash them together, you'd end up with this guy. They look, it's like it's the same person. I don't know. Maybe they were going for a look and couldn't get either one of those two, so it's like, who's next in line here that looks like this? I don't know. You did a great job anyway. I'm glad you were there. Thank you. I just had to amuse on that for a second. Um, I can't really say enough about this show. I can't. If you want to watch 10 hours of really good sci-fi, I mean, it's not really, really deep and, you know, heavy, heady stuff. It's not really heady stuff. It is, if you think about it, you have to pay attention to get the entire story. But it's not like... I'm trying to think of how best to put this. This isn't 2001, or this isn't... where, there, where there's, like, a theme or a message or anything like that in it. It's just solid storytelling in this sci-fi environment that looks, sounds amazing. It's played amazing, it's written very well, it's performed very well, That it's just all around a perfect, almost perfect package. And I'm giving, season one, I'm giving a 4.4 out of five. My next video that I'm gonna record right after this, I'm gonna talk about season two, which quite frankly, was a pale imitation of season one. So after you watch this, I'm sure it'll show up either in the little box right here or find it on the side. See what I'm talking about for season two. Did not like it nearly as much. 4.4 out of 5, Altered Carbon, season one. Thanks for watching, guys.